Los Angeles. We gather at the very site where persons of Japanese ancestry gathered 80 years ago. We now proclaim the Idecho as a national monument to the wartime incarceration by opening the cover of this sacred book of names. We carry with us the gate of wood, the wooden tablets on which the names of 75 U.S. internment and concentration camps are recorded by bringing forth the very soil of incarceration by camp survivors, descendants, those associated with the preservation and education about the camps, and clergy and faith leaders. From the bombing of Pearl Harbor that shattered our everyday lives, we remember. From the roundup and imprisonment of our Issei leaders, priests, ministers, and community leaders, we remember. From the signing of Executive Order 9066 that forced our evacuation, we remember. I hope you remember that this book represents people. There are people in this audience whose names are in this book. There are people in this audience whose families are in this book. There are people in this audience whose friends and loved ones are in this book. But they will put their stamp next to their family's name their name, their friend's name, to remember them and acknowledge them. Thank you folks for joining us for today's program on the Ide National Monument for the World War II Japanese American Incarceration. To kick us off on this conversation, I want to read us a small piece from the 1973 song Yellow Pearl from the album A Grain of Sand by Chris Kondo Ijima, Nobuko Miyamoto, and Charlie Chen. A grain, any grain of the monster, and time is telling only how long it takes layer after layer, as its beauty unfolds until its captor it holds in peril, a grain, a tiny grain of sand. And each of us today did bring some sand uh, for this project and for this event. And uh, I'll be reading a little bit off from the about page about this project uh, with Professor Duncan Williams of USC uh, Shinso Ito Center. And the summary of the project is this. This is the first time a comprehensive list of the over 125,000 persons of Japanese ancestry who were unjustly imprisoned in the U.S. Army, Department of Justice, and War Relocation Authority camps have been successfully compiled, and thus, the first time it has been possible to properly memorialize each incarcerate as distinct individuals instead of a generalized community. By placing their names front and center, the Ide National Monument Project seeks to expand and re-envision what a monument is through three distinct but interlinking elements, a sacred book of names as monument, Idecho, a website monument, Idezo, and light sculpture monuments, Idehi. So I'll pass it to Kimiko to start off our conversation. Thanks, Kurt. Um, so I'm here co-hosting with Aaron Oyama. Uh, we're both on the steering committee for Tanaima this year. And the reason why that we wanted to start off our program with this specific topic is because the uh, overall theme for Tadaima this year is memory, um, how we remember things, how we can use memory to keep, uh, you know, with history. Um, and this project is obviously the most expansive, largest thing that has happened uh, in the community in many, many years. Um, so uh, we wanted to invite people who actually were able to attend 
the ceremony in Los Angeles, which I hear had over 200 people participating in it. And then there were also people um, who participated like Aaron or myself, we both went and got dirt from sites um, to have at the ceremony, but Nancy, Janice, Kurt and Rob actually attended and represented a specific site. And we wanted to kind of talk to them about what that felt like, what it meant to them, what it, what, you know, it means to the community to do this type of, this type of remembering. And uh, I was uh, uh, the one who gathered the dirt for uh, Topaz when I was out there visiting in July. And um, I will pass it off to Erin and Erin can tell which site that she had gathered dirt from. Thanks, Kimiko. And thank you, Kurt, for starting us off in that way. Um, my name is Erin Aoyama, and I went to Camp Upton, actually in Long Island with my dad, to gather soil, um, partly because it was the closest location to where I live on the East Coast that Duncan <laughs> still needed soil from. But also I realized in the process of trying to figure out, you know, maybe who I knew in New York area who could go out to Long Island, um, that Camp Upton became Brookhaven National Laboratories in the late 1940s, um, which once I saw that, I remembered my grandfather who served in the 442nd after he recovered and was released from the hospital and released from the army actually worked at Brookhaven National Laboratories um, with a couple of friends from the 442 for a couple of years. My grandmother met in New York and actually got married in Upton, New York, which is where this camp was and these labs were. So it was a really kind of amazing experience, amazing learning experience that came from Duncan calling and saying, do you know anyone who could go out to Long Island and gather the soil? Um, so it was really meaningful for my dad and I to drive out there together, um, you know, sit in traffic most of the way on a really rainy day and then pull over kind of sketchily on the side of the highway and dig up some soil near this historical marker. Um, but it was really a kind of incredible experience of bringing together both like family history and a place where I live close to now and this site of Issa incarceration that was very small, um, but was nonetheless a place where members of our community were taken um, and held during World War II. So very meaningful. And I'm so grateful to the four of you, Nancy, Janice, Kurt, and Rob for having this conversation with us today. I think what we'll do now is just ask, we'll go sort of in a, in a row here and I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves however you wanna introduce yourself um, and then let us know why you were there, what sort of site you were representing um, and then maybe just to kick us off what it felt like to be at this gathering um, in this particular form of remembering um, and how you've sort of reflected on that in the weeks since, um, since this ceremony happened. So Nancy, I will pass it to you and then we'll go to Rob and then Janice and then Kurt will bring it back to you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Nancy Ukai and I'm director of the 50 Objects digital website. And also I'm a member of the Wakasa Memorial Committee. And Duncan had um, was talking to him about the Irecho and the project. And he asked me if I would go to Sharp Park detention site south of San Francisco, which was a site for about 190 Issei, and go there to collect earth, and of course. So um, I drove down there, and um, the San Francisco Archery Club has been based there for decades. I happened to meet the president of the club, who has familiar with the area for 30 years, and he said, oh, you should go to the staircase. It's the only remnant from the camp. And it was a concrete stairwell with about five or six stairs. And um, and he said it led up to a barrack or some sort of building. And so I was really glad to know that because it's acres of land. And I didn't want to just go anywhere and spoon up some dirt, although I could have done that. And it was very moving to just sort of be at the foot of the stairs. And then fast forward to Los Angeles, be um, with two people who had um, direct connections to Sharp Park. Um, and then to carry the memorial tablet with the earth in it and know that grains of earth from the 75 confinement sites had been mixed into this clay and that um, a craftsperson had made that into sort of this tablet which was inset into the book cover. So the whole experience was um, a bit of kind of time traveling 
thinking about our ancestors and then interacting with this book, which we did in LA. Um, and in terms of what it was like to be there, it was really um, fantastic to be after COVID, especially with many people from all across the country, some of whom I only knew through Zoom calls and others who I hadn't seen in a few years. And one thing it did was remind me of my parents because I grew up, I'm a Sansei, hearing them in gatherings saying to each other, what camp were you in? Um, of course, many of us have that experience. And what I saw at this big gathering was people saying to each other, what camp are you representing? And it just felt like an echo from the past. And here we are carrying on that memory through this ceremony and this process of collecting earth and, you know, there to honor the 125,284 names that the team meticulously collected, cross-referenced, and came to this list, which honors each individual. So um, still processing it and grateful to our community um, and to Duncan, of course, and to Janum and to everybody, the religious figures who were there who just knit us together. Thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing that. Rob. Um, and thanks for the invitation to be here this evening. It's a, a great pleasure to speak about this experience. Um, my name is Rob Busher, and I serve as the JACL Philadelphia chapter president. I'm also a staff member at the Japan America Society of Greater Philadelphia, who uh, administers the programs at Shofuso Japanese House and Garden in West Philadelphia. In this particular project, uh, Duncan had reached out to me, uh, much like everyone on this call, I suspect, to ask if I could help him collect a bit of dirt from a site that was pretty far from anyone else in his Rolodex. And, and that was Bedford Springs Hotel in Western Pennsylvania, in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, bordering the farther western border of Maryland and West Virginia in a place that is culturally more like Appalachia than the East Coast where I live in Philadelphia. Um, and yet uh, we luckily had a JACL Philadelphia member who lives in the Pittsburgh suburbs that was willing to take the hour and a half drive from where she lived and go and collect some soil. Um, and it was an interesting installation because uh, unlike, I think, the better known camps, um, this was one of the sites where Japanese nationals were being held. About 184 diplomatic officials and consular officials from the Empire of Japan were detained in the Bedford Springs Hotel uh, for the duration of the war, including the Japanese ambassador to Germany after the fall of Berlin and his uh, diplomatic attache. Uh, so it was a very high profile installation. Um, as you might imagine, uh, there was a lot of resistance from the local Pennsylvanians uh, when it came to be known that there would be actual enemy aliens, not Japanese Americans, but people who were working for the Empire of Japan um, being housed at what then was a four-star hotel and, and is now a, still a four-star hotel. Um, so, you know, we can kind of talk a little bit more about the history of that particular site if, if people are interested in it. But the, the one thing that kind of stuck out for me that I'll just share quickly, uh, because this was a site where Japanese nationals were being held, um, and it did include families. It was the, the consular officials and their families, wives and children. Um, so that's important to name because the woman who gathered the soil, Miko Green, is herself a Japanese expat. It was a really important experience that helped to connect some of the experience of wartime incarceration, not just for her, but for the extended Shin Mike Japanese expat community um, that, that I work with now at the Japan America Society who have started to see the wartime incarceration in a new light through the eyes of these diplomatic officials and their families. So it's a, a very little known piece of history, even here in Pennsylvania. And I think um, this will lead to some more conversations and hopefully some more knowledge about this site. Thank you. 
so then just quickly in terms of immediate first reflections on on being at the Idei Chol ceremony my family was in southern california before the attack on pearl harbor they had a, a small farm that they leased on the Kurata ranch near current day gardena torrance area and uh they used to worship at the Nishi Honganji Buddhist mm -hmm. temple in Little Tokyo, where we started our procession. And being that the site I was representing starts with a B, there were only about two sites, Angel Island and Amachi, I think, that were in front of us in line. And so I had a chance to just kind of think about the, the place and think about being inside of the old Nishi Hongan and what it meant, I guess, to... Uh, look at the ceiling and, and kind of look at the, the hand railing on the stairs and just reflect for a moment that this was a space where my great grandparents and my Obachan and her siblings uh, spent a lot of time on the weekends and probably went to some of these community convenings before they ultimately fled instead of going to the wartime uh, relocation camps. Um, so it was very impactful, and I was I was grateful to be a part of this, and I, I look forward to reflecting further with everyone on this call. Thank you so much, Rob, for sharing that. So interesting. Um, Janice. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this conversation. My name is Janice Hidohama, and I am an amateur genealogist and family historian. Uh, I am a recovering lawyer. And I am someone who's um, been visiting as many incarceration sites as possible. So I've been to, you see, I think seven WRA uh, camps and plus Crystal City. And I uh, really want to, to visit more. And one reason that I have wanted to do that is I believe very much when doing family history and community history and the, the power of place and how important it is to stand on the ground where people uh, actually had the experiences that you're trying to understand. Uh, I am a descendant of um, Poston incarcerees. My grandparents, my mother and her siblings were all incarcerated at Poston, but I was participating in the ceremony representing a site called the Hillcrest Sanitarium. And that is a tuberculosis sanitarium that was run, I believe, by the County of Los Angeles in the Glendale, California area, I believe, in a place called La Crescenta, actually, which is near Glendale. Uh, and it was a place where Japanese Americans with tuberculosis were incarcerated uh, involuntarily. And I was paired in the procession with uh, a man whose father had actually been incarcerated at Hillcrest. Um, so I was really rather amazed that there it's a, a really uh, obscure incarceration site and a small one, um, although famous for, I think, um, or significant for having had Estelle and Estelle Ishigo uh, connection, a famous artist from Heart Mountain who was uh, not Japanese American. Uh, and so I was in my role as a Buddhist minister's assistant. I am a, a minister's assistant at the Orange County Buddhist Church. And so I was wearing my, my clerical garb. And so I was really kind of imbued with the, the religious significance of what was going on in the ceremony as well. I would say the, the reason why I visit camps, uh, apart from trying to get an insight into what it was like for the people who were there, was also to try and, and get a better sense, the same reason I do genealogy and family history why I am the way I am, what formed me. And it was because of the experiences that, that my mother had, the experiences that my other family members had, the experiences that our community went through. And so this is all part of my quest of kind of working that out, um, understanding and coming to terms with intergenerational trauma. Uh, I would say in reflecting on the experiences from the Ida Cho installation ceremony, that this was a, a really powerful moment for me. It was a time when my passion for, for genealogy and my uh, research into community and family history and my spiritual path all intersected in this you know, really profound way. And so it was a, a, a extremely meaningful experience uh, for me and I was really honored to be able to participate. 
Thank you so much for sharing that, Janice. That's great. Kurt, the famous Kurt Ikeda. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm just honored to be here with Nancy, with Janice, with Rob, obviously yourself, Aaron, and Kimiko as well. Um, gosh, September 24th, folks, when we all gathered in Los Angeles, I mean, 200, you know, members of the community, faith leaders, survivors, descendants. It really was, I think, a breathtaking experience. Uh, my name is Kurt Ikeda, how you see him pronouns, and I am the Director of Interpretation and Education at Mayadoka National Historic Site in Jerome, Idaho on the ancestral lands of the Shoshone Bannock peoples. Uh, I'm a Shinike, I'm a Shinise, actually second generation Japanese American child of immigrants, uh, but my grandfather through marriage was incarcerated in Crystal City. And um, just like how Janice, you were saying about, you know, going to these places of in confinement, you know, bringing together 75 sites of confinement, of incarceration, of, of pain, of memory, of trauma, and then bringing that, you know, dirt, sand, silt, earth as nancy said i love that term earth i think it just really captures it so much more into this one singular place i think for me who kind of came into this community or into this work a little bit later in my life uh it kind of felt like the like sites of confinement were coming to us you know it, it kind of provides this this way of giving folks um, who may not have had the chance to jump into the story a place to jump in i think we were just talking about that as a group kimiko was talking about her family and how just a greater number of people within our communities taking this consciousness and it's because right professor duncan williams and his whole team you know really brought together this really incredible project right if i'm getting this right 125,284 names total right and the basis of that really came from from my understanding of the to do for solidarity movement and just trying to make sure that there was a way to honor every single person and as professor williams as we all know the incredible researcher uh, was tasked with kind of the remembrance he said well how many names do we actually have you know we have this general 125,000. um but being able to even just make this not just one singular event on september 24th at Japanese American National Museum in Little Tokyo, such an important place, as Rob was saying, uh, for, for his family. But I think it's gonna be continuing to be building into this great, great project. Um, as I said earlier, I represented Minidoka National Historic Site, which was then Minidoka Relocation Center, a concentration camp in the South Idaho desert, right? One of those 10 American concentration camps that folks uh, tend to have a big understanding of, but may not be, um, you know, the leeway, right, to give into the other 65 various sites. I'm just so happy to be hearing from Janice and from Rob and Nancy about those other sites that I never learned about in my studies growing up, let alone even now. I was there uh, alongside Fujiko Tamura Gardner, a survivor from Washington, a survivor of Minidoka, with Reverend Emery Brooks Andrews, a faith leader whose father was actually, uh, went with his congregation to Minidoka, a white ally who was just there truly experiencing the pain and providing faith as a way of building community in a concentration camp for those in a concentration camp. And of course, Friends of Mayadoka Executive Director Robin Achilles. So we were a pretty big team. We were we were not many for Mayadoka. We were a big team of four. And uh, it really was this incredible moment as Rob was kind of talking about his feelings at the experience. I remember also kind of walking out. We were at the M's, so a little bit later. Um, but as we were walking out, we, we tried to create this line together and we kind of walked, you know, in solidarity, holding those tablets as Nancy had discussed. And on that tablet, the name of each of these sites of confinement and the sand that was collected. Uh, you're probably asking or thinking to yourself, viewer, well, Ranger Kurt, when Professor Williams asked you for dirt from a national park, what did you do? Uh, well, viewer, I will remind everybody here that collecting sand, dirt, artifacts, or plants from a national park is completely illegal, and that for specific events of this magnitude and importance, uh, let's just say that there were certain conversations and phone calls made so that Minidoka and all of the 13,000 plus people who were there could be remembered. Um, but please, please, please do not do not take things from your national parks. There are important resources. Um, but to answer your question directly, Aaron, when I think about this experience, actually, the first thing that comes to my mind, and folks can probably tell I'm a very art-oriented person, starting with Nobuko Miyamoto and Yellow Pearl, uh, that that poem from the song, I think about the Wood, Woody Guthrie song, 1945, This Land is Your Land, and it was a true activist song for those who kind of study their music history, and I think about how This Land is Your Land, I think, really fits this feeling, right, this gathering of sand of different colors, of different feelings and, and coarseness and densities and all kind of coming together as Nancy was saying into this this tablet that we all were kind of instructed collectively to 
pray in front of and to and to really touch and feel. And I think Duncan said the word activate. Oh, what an incredible term. This land is your land really, really came to me. Um, I think about the allies, right? We represent a small subset of people who were there, but, you know, from Heart Mountain, Mountain the, the Crow tribe, the Psalica tribe, you know, representing us and kind of starting off this wonderful ceremony. I think about the taiko music that was playing and reverberating through Little Tokyo. I think about all the allies who were there standing with us, like Reverend Brooks Andrews with Minidoka, but I also think about all the new allies who will continue to be curious about the story or folks in our families who are gonna now take this as a jumping off point to go honor each of these names, which is the calling, the call to action that Professor Williams gave to all of us. When you go to Janum, that's a big part of activating. And we can talk about that more later, but I'm just so excited to be here with all these wonderful folks today. So I'll pass it back to you, Aaron. Thank you so much, Kurt. And I wanna give, or we wanna give all of you a chance to respond to each other and talk with each other. Kimiko and I are really here to hang and to, <laughs> to hear from all of you. But I think there's so many really important and meaningful and complex themes that came up here from names. Like what does it mean to name folks and to spell names correctly, to go through the records and have, you know, I know I checked to see because my family's name spellings have many different versions of them. And I wanted to see which one was we could decide was the correct one. So we could talk about names, we could talk about place and the sort of significant of, significance of studying and visiting these these sites of incarceration in place, but then what it meant to bring some of that somewhere else and how we sort of think about that in the context of American history. And then I really think what I want to hear from each of you is sort of, Kurt, what you were just getting at, like, what does this mean for folks who aren't in Los Angeles or can't easily come to Janum or to the Japanese American National Museum or are not Japanese American? How does this memory, you know, compel us to look outwards from our community too? How is this project asking us to place our history in context and place us alongside other communities who have faced, are facing ongoing sort of um, oppression at the hands of the state? We could just say it as it is. Um, so I wonder sort of how each of you are engaging with that, with this, this idea of memory as a call to action. What does that mean? Um, and what do we do with this? And that was like 10 questions in one. So feel free to pick any of them or none of them. Um, but we just love to hear, hear some thoughts, more thoughts. One thing, um, Ann Burroughs, the president of Janum, the CEO of Janum described this gathering as was a pilgrimage. Um, and it kind of felt like that because people had come from all over the country and different places to be present at the launching, the activation of this memorial book. And um, th this may sound a little strange, but I actually thought of the Vietnam War Memorial when I was there because of the names. And, you know, if you've been there, you know, it's this big granite sculpture made by um, Maya Lin. And it was really revolutionary for its time because it listed all the names. And I think it was in chronological order of the people who died. And this book, which contains the names, is really interesting because it's a thousand pages, but there are no page numbers. <laughs> it's And so when people were trying to look for the names of their ancestors, they had these specific directions of knowing when they were born. And then you had to consult this reference book and kind of know in general where on the page your ancestor's name was so then you could find it it was quite labor intensive and laborious but i thought that was part of the beauty of it it wasn't efficient and each name was um like on the maya lynn memorial just this continual flow of humanity and yet each individual was recognized um i found my mother's name i was asked to put my honko on the name of one other person and so i felt that the team led by Duncan had created this process which engaged us in thinking about our ancestors, physically coming together, interacting, you know, we could touch the book. Um, there were so many ways that they tried to activate our senses. And so it wasn't just an intellectual exercise, nor was it just you go someplace on a pilgrimage and then do something. It was, it was extremely profound. And um, I'm, I'm just really interested to hear how other people felt about that experience. 
I think engaging with the EDHO itself was one of the more fascinating components and, and being asked to put a Hanko stamp on, on one name as part of the commemoration. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, my family, the Marumotos, fled California during the so-called voluntary evacuation. So they didn't go to camp. And of course, we have many relatives who did, uh, in including some cousins who made the beautiful uh, boss relief camp carving there from rower hanging on my wall. But um, the person whose name I chose was actually uh, a, a mentor and, and dear friend of mine in, in the JACL, Hiro Nishikawa, who um, really, since I became involved in the Japanese American community, I think has helped to show me the way and um, lead me in, in positive uh, and challenging directions as far as my, my journey as an activist. Um, and so just that kind of moment of having to, to think about, you know, again, because I don't have close family members that were in camp, like who do I want to honor in this moment? And then what does that mean for me? Um, but also what does that mean for him? And what does that mean for any of these people who are living and, and who have passed, who, who are being commemorated in this capacity? Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to have something like this being commemorated so long after the camps closed and you know we really sort of feel the the necessity and, and the urgency maybe for the survivors and the the, the few members of the Nisei and the elder Sansei generations that remain who lived in the camps um, and we see those dwindling numbers and and uh, unfortunately these these frail bodies now that are had joined us on this pilgrimage and it it helps it, it makes me think i think really about the the impermanence and the the reality that we are coming to the the close of this chapter of the japanese american story in in a certain way in the sense that you know in a, another 10 or 15 20 years we won't have any survivors left and then it's really up to us who are left who are descendants who are kind of uh, also allies and and folks who care about this history to carry that forward and, you know, a monument like this and a project like this that's sort of rooted in the past, but then has this very, I think, intentional contemporary aspect, I think allows us to, in some ways, pass a torch. Because I, I, I understand that that was actually one of the intentions behind the Tsuru March in Washington that never materialized because of the pandemic, this idea that we could come together in mass of all of these incarceration survivors, but also the descendants and this idea that this would be this kind of last great march of the Nisei. And because that didn't materialize, um, I think there's been this, this sense of loss and there's this sense of, of hurt in some ways that we've all felt in, in different manifestations because of the pandemic. But I, I really felt being there that that was this kind of moment when we see young activists and artists and scholars in the JA community who are marching arm in arm with the elders who have been doing this since the very first pilgrimages at Tuli Lake in Manzanar. And that was really special. And I, I think like, I can't overstate what it meant to be able to, to do that, participate in that moment. And I think again, you know, few times are you aware that you're involved in a historical event as you're living through it. But I think that really felt that way. Yeah, so many thoughts that that come to mind in uh, what was brought up by, by Nancy and Rob and, and Kurt. When I think about the names, um, I was really struck by the comments that Duncan made to us in our kind of orientation and instructions before we uh, lined up and began our procession, which was he said this, monument is not meant to be permanent. It's not static. It's, um, uh, it's meant to be dynamic and moving. It's, it's, you know, provisions have been made in this project to, to add names, to correct names. The whole process of marking names uh, to acknowledge and honor people with the Honko, it's forcing you to, you know, engage um, with the names, to see the materiality of the names as as um, represented in this book that weighs, you know, 25 pounds and is a thousand pages long. Um, and he, D 
Duncan made this really striking comment, which really stuck with me, which is that, you know, we are the monument. You know, we are the monument as well. I mean, this is, uh, and when you see the names, as, as Nancy mentioned, it's not meant to be efficient. There's this, like the Vietnam uh, War Memorial, it is a constant, the flow of names, and that, that's a, that kind of dynamism, that flow through time uh, that uh, I think Duncan was, was alluding to. And so I think uh, that was a, a part of the whole experience for, for me uh, with that. And what you said, Nancy, about the process not being efficient, you know, because of, of the way the names are listed. I think that one idea was that we were paying uh, tribute to our elders in, in the Japanese way by putting the oldest first. So there was a cultural component to it. Um, but also the fact that it wasn't efficient. You know, I was in that line. I was kind of toward the beginning of the line and I was probably there for an hour. <laughs> and I think there were people at the end of the line who had been waiting for two and a half hours or more. Uh, but that enabled me to strike up conversations with all the people around me. And I was like, you know, what's your family story? What, you know, which camp were you representing? Um, what names are you choosing to honor? Uh, and so that was kind of also a part of this living aspect of the memorial and engaging with it. Um, and kind of creating this, this um, and appreciating the, the community that, that we've built around this, this kind of living monument. I love that I'm last in the order of things because I get to think the most before my comments um, and, and all the best things are already said. And I really appreciate what Janice said here. I, I'm almost at a loss of words because just how deep Janice, you, you, I think you really got to the point of where all of us are going from. It's, it was gathering. It's almost like that gathering was its own kind of EDA experience. You know, as, and the folks who are watching probably understand, right, the EDA term kind of coming back to Manzanar. And I believe there's also another camp that, and I, someone might be able to remind me which other camp had that terminology of this kind of soul consoling tower. Rob, is that one? I think it was Rower. Rower, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, see, when you have all the scholars together, it's great. Uh, so it's kind of soul consoling experience. Um, you know, for us, the National Park Service it was myself, Hanukkah Wakatsuki. There was Elisa and Brenda and Patricia from Manzanar. You know, I think all of us as folks who steward uh, and, and preserve the story from the federal government side, I think it was really important to be at this gathering. I mean, let's just take a second, all of us on this call. I mean, there was, we will probably never have that gathering of those people from our community in the same place ever again. I mean, uh, until and when that Sudo March, right, it happens on Washington. I mean, that will be the next time we all see each other in that same way. And I think it goes to the dy dynamism of, of Reverend Duncan Duke and Williams, right, and his kind of ability to bring us all together. I know he said that we're the monument, but I really do think that all thanks goes to him and his team truly in, in bringing us together in that way. For myself, in terms of the stamping moment, I actually uh, was there to witness Fujiko Tamura Gardner, uh, the survivor I was speaking of, and I was kind of holding her arm the whole time, uh, you know, and kind of having this this almost quasi grandson experience. If I could even say that, gosh, I hope Fujiko's <laughs> watching this. Um, it just was such a, a deeply profound experience for me. And, you know, for her, I was wondering if she was going to stamp uh, or aim to stamp her name. And she said, I want to stamp my parents. And soul consoling right i mean i mean that's what that space was that she wanted to use that space and time to honor her parents who, who would not have even dreamed i think of this project of this day you know i think of reverend andrews and a lot of these folks you know we were told to bring mementos if we'd like and uh, reverend brooks andrews the son of reverend andrews who once again the, the, the ally who came to minidoka with this congregation you know was holding a picture of his dad he would use that to strike up conversations. I mean, all of us not only brought our stories, but some of us brought items, you know. I know some folks brought their own prayer beads and some folks just had different garb on, right? That just really represented each of us. It was so individual and yet so collective. Um, all this to say, you know, when we were all in the Tate Uchi form and as we were all trying to form our lines, and I think all of us there can remember, it was a little hectic, right? We were all kind of stuck together and wearing our masks and trying to get in the line of, of name order. I mean, it really was this really long experience. Um, I, I feel, if I may, and I wish, uh, I hope that Duncan's watching this, you know, it almost became its own Ide or soul consoling day, right? Ide no hi. It almost was like this full day or weekend of soul consoling. And I actually maybe wanted to throw a question out to the group here. Um, you know, since it was one of the biggest gatherings we've had in the in the in the pandemic age, 
you know, who should we bring into this conversation? I mean, who are you excited to see when, when you saw this person, you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't talked to you in forever. Or you just got that smile on your face. I, I'd love to hear, you know, uh, Janice, was there somebody you saw at this event that just really built you back up again to continue to do the work that you did? Maybe we could play with that question a little bit more. Uh, since you called me out, uh, it's it's really hard to say. It was like a huge family reunion almost. And I saw people from all segments of my life, you know, people I knew from camp reunions, people I had met in the Japanese American Facebook group, people that I had um, engaged with in, in social justice work. And uh, to see all of those people there, it was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, you know, you, I know it's there's a pandemic still going on. But, you know, to be able to see people and hug people, I mean, that was really profound. Um, but every survivor I saw, I mean, that was really just a real uh profound thing because, you know, as, as others of you have alluded to, we are losing our last witnesses. These were the last um, witnesses. Um, and they were there with their walkers or in their wheelchairs or, you know, with their canes, but they were there. Um, and so every survivor I saw, just, it was really just a, a real, you know, feeling in the heart. If, if I can just jump in, um, I was so shocked to see um, Shetan Sav win, who I met. Um, from, she was from AIM, Oklahoma, and I met her at Fort Sill. And I didn't know she was coming to represent Fort Sill, and that's where she gathered dirt. And um, it just brought back, again, memories of standing together at Fort Sill and in Lawton, Oklahoma, to protest the use of a former incarceration site for 700 Issei. Um, to stand and, and protest the bringing in of immigrant children. And in fact, Duncan Williams was there and Tommy Keta talked about um, Kanesaburo Oshima who got shot in the head there. And um, so I guess it's just layers and layers of memory and history that when you meet somebody, it all kind of washes over you. But in during the pandemic, we haven't had that opportunity. So that was so precious. And another thing that I really thought of was the people who have no relatives the Issei, who, men who died, James Wakasa, um, Kobata, and Isomura at Lordsburg, who don't have descendants to put a honko by their name. And that made me really sad. Um, and it made me think that, well, I, I chose my mother's name, Fumiko Louise Takayanagi. And by the way, her middle name was not Louise, but she wanted an American name and gave that to herself. And it's in the WRI records as such. And now it's in the Ureicho. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and then I chose the name of my aunt who didn't get married, doesn't have descendants. And um, Barbara Takei said to me, you know, I'm thinking of a relative who may not have a descendant to write, to, you know, re re remember them. And so it really made me think about the many people who we want to continue to try and recognize in some way. And how do you do that? And one way is to remember the stories and the family stories. And that's why the genealogy you do, Janice, is so important. It was interesting to see so many people that I've known for so many years in different places of the Japanese American community. And I feel like I, I sort of straddle like a, th a few people here, like academia and activism and, and also like arts organizing. Um, so some of these people I've known through Tsuru, some people from JACL, others are academics and scholars that I've met at conferences or maybe people whose work I've just been familiar with. And it just sort of really struck me that among this group, this was really kind of everyone who is deeply involved in this space at this moment. And of course, there were some people missing. There were limited seats that were available. But really, I don't think there's been a gathering like this uh, in, in our era of so many people who are doing this work across so many different sectors that are, you know, also then spread throughout the country because of the the nature of, of gathering the soil and representing these different sites. Um, but I think the thing that actually really struck me the most was how many people I've known just through Zoom um, <laughs> over, over the last couple of years of the pandemic, doing a lot of community work and, and working regularly with people, some that I've spoken to on a weekly basis and actually seeing them for the first time in person. And, and what an incredible gift that was. 
maybe that's a great segue back to Tadaima, right? I mean, it almost feels very Tadaima esque 2020, right? I mean, this this huge gathering, 380 plus programs, all the partners. I mean, it, it almost, it, it all feels like this continuation, like we're just continuing this work and and it's all building on top of each other, you know, Tsuru, Tadaima, Irehi, Irecho, Irezo, um, all, all of that. It, it truly was incredible. And I think, Rob, I think you got to it too. It's not like everybody was there, right? I mean, if we, we all wouldn't fit in the Tateuchi Forum if we were all there because the community is so wide. And over these past two, three years of struggle with health, and with pain and with loss, I think we've collectively found this virtual community um, and coming together was great. I, I'll, I'll be selfish with my own question, seeing Kanji Sahara, who we all know on this call was just, I mean, he 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 was the person who brought me into the community, period. Um, and then Bruce Embry challenged me to think deeper about the community. And folks like Nancy and Janice, who I, you, I've been, I've been uh, social media friends with you for a long time, and suddenly here we are in the same place. And and obviously Rob is my brother-in-law. You know, it's just it, it really <laughs> was this family gathering. You know, Kanji, um, Kanji's getting older, and uh, I, you know, saw him and Jan, and I put my mask down for a second so he could see my face. You know, I was in uniform, so I didn't know if he'd recognize me. And you know, and I said, Kanji, you know, do you remember who I am? And he goes, Kurt, and and. And that's your wife, April, and it just, it, I didn't know if I'd see him again, um, being in where I am in Idaho now, and and just seeing the man who brought me into this community and made the space for this Shin Nike to, to find new grandparents after mine passed, to find stories that weren't shared, and Rob, I bet you feel very much the same way, right, these stories that are passed on to us, it, I, I just, I was so happy in <laughs> seeing Kanji Sahara. I, I just really want to call him into the space today. And being with our elders, I think for a lot of our elders in the community, this may have been a good way of activating memory, um, you know, with by, by being there. And, you know, the screens on faces is, is, is one thing, but in person and shaking hands or sharing a bento box together is another. So um, while I may not be the biggest expert in memory, the person who is the expert in memory is on this panel. Um, and memory in our community, but I really feel like I, I assume for our elder community and for us younger folks too, this did charge our memory and and brought up those names and those faces and those experiences that do that we do remember. I do believe there was memory gained uh, in that experience. And I think we call it a sacred book of names, but a sense of that sacredness was in meeting the elders, um, and. Janice, I'm curious to know what you might think of the interfaith um, aspect of this, because I thought it was interesting and important that Duncan, you know, made each representative group of a confinement site have some kind of faith leader in it, um, which gave it a spiritual quality um, and also an opportunity to meet people in a way that wasn't just purely secular. Yeah, thank you for, for asking that, Nancy. Um, I was there um, partly in a, a clerical kind of role. And I think that, of course, we know Duncan's um, academic work has been really focused on uh, uncovering the history of, of Buddhism uh, in, in the camps and in Hawaii under martial law in Hawaii as well. Uh, and, and really uncovering this, this history um, that had been suppressed for a long time. Uh, and so, but this was uh, truly an, an, an interfaith gathering. So there were Christian, Shinto, and, and Buddhist clergy all involved. And some of them represented allies, you know, people within um, the Quaker communities or the Presbyterian church or the, um, who had, had really been like, like um, uh, I'm sorry, Kurt, uh, em Emery uh, Brooks, uh, I'm sure I got the name Andrews, wrong. Andrews, yeah. Mm -hmm. Emory Andrews. Um, so that was really profound. And I think one of the moments there were, the religious liturgy was incorporated into the, the ceremony itself when we got into the, the Janum Hall. And so there were a Christian responsive reading. There was Buddhist chanting as we all came up to uh, offer the uh, the Sotoba or the memorial tablets, the memorial tablets themselves are a Buddhist uh, kind of, of way of, of memorializing uh, the dead. And I think all of that really 
uh, added to the solemnity of the occasion, but it also reminded us that this is a memorial, a memorial you know, that has religious, spiritual significance, and we are paying tribute to and remembering the dead um, as well as the living. One of my friends who's a, a Buddhist minister uh, turned to me afterwards and said, you know, when we were doing that Christian responsive reading, she said, it was really hard for me not to just start weeping because it was so powerful. You know, I mean, she and I are not Christians, but that was that was kind of the, the feeling that we were getting. It was just very, very powerful to bring that spiritual component into it um, and to reflect on, you know, what spirituality gave our our ancestors um, in, the, in the camps in, in under incarceration, under the most when everything was taken from them, you know, what did they have left? But, um, you know, their, their, their faith, you know, and their families um, and their sense of self. That's, that's what they had. So I thought the religious component was, was really significant. And I um, really appreciated that uh, Duncan Williams incorporated that deeply into the day's activities. I'm glad that you kind of brought that back into the conversation because I've been reflecting a lot on that as well um, as someone who you know was raised I think without religion to a certain age and then our family started exploring Christianity um, I've always been interested in Buddhism and I consider myself a Buddhist now but I don't have a, a congregation nearby where I live in Philadelphia um, so aside from the Seabrook Buddhist temple 45 minutes drive it's our closest Jodo Shinshu Buddhist temple, go there maybe once or twice a year kind of thing. But um, that idea, again, like bookending this experience of being in the old Nishihonganji building where my family worshipped. And I I was very lucky that my hibacha, my great grandmother, lived until I was in college. And uh, she was a devout Buddhist. So when I spent time with her, then I was around that. Um, I remember, you know, visiting the Butsudan in her home when, whenever I would come and visit her to pay respects to my great grandfather. And so like having that kind of component to begin the, the march and then being surrounded by Buddhist clergy, um, both of the people sitting to either side of me were Buddhist ministers. And so it was really this kind of moving experience to to hear the chanting and one of the uh, ministers whose name I've, I've forgotten, they were uh, from Ogden, Utah, which is where my family ended up after they fled California. And uh, my great grandfather's cousin um, had been in Ogden prior to Pearl Harbor, and that's why they decided to go there. And he was the leader of his Buddhist association, and the FBI arrested him and sent him to Crystal City. So um, the, that theme of Buddhism and the kind of dangerous aspects of it, I think, have always been very front of mind to me when I, I think about the, that time period and what our family endured, but how special it was to kind of reclaim that, that in that moment to just be surrounded by Buddhist chanting. And um, it did feel extremely spiritual. Um, I think the thing that uh, Bill Fujioka um, the board president at, at Janum had shared was that we have now exceeded the occupation capacity because there are 125,284 people in this room in addition to the members seated. And uh, it did feel like that. It really did. And it felt like uh, to be able to, again, give closure, maybe I hope to the, the spirits of, the, of those like my great grandfather who passed before the redress movement was completed and never knew that this country apologized for the things that our family endured to console that spirit and the many others um i, I think is very meaningful in a way that i i think we'll have to continue to discuss for years to come and i think that that's so true rob and and um it's not just that we're only remembering and i know you're focusing on memory in this tadaima but it's also to repair. And I think to go through that was to not only remember and respect and reflect on our history, but also to create to do something to help repair that within ourselves. But then by having these community connections 
to come together also and um, build, you know, that's our legacy now and the legacy, living legacy of this Irecho going forward. Yeah, seeing everybody gathered together like that just reminded me that, you know, we we were a diaspora, right? After, especially after camp, there was this intentional effort to um, disperse Japanese Americans across the country and, and to kind of destroy our communities of origin on the West Coast. Uh, and then to see, this was extremely powerful to see all these people from all over the country gathered together and, you know, survivors, but also, you know, Gose. I, I, I saw a guy there, I think, with the Gokuse t-shirt on at one point uh, and and to say we're still here and we're still a community, you know. So I was wondering what what the rest of you thought about um, this as future community building. Uh, that's a, um, a great segue, <clears throat> Janice, because we actually wanted to just ask for, for a few short words or thoughts about the future and what you see the, the future of, I mean, now that we're in essence talking about people of our, you know, all of us here are various generations, but that we are going to be the culture bearers. Some of us already are, you know, but, but you know, it's going to start falling onto us. So what is the future of memory for this time period in Japanese American history? I think it's um, reaching out to other communities and understanding the similarities that we share. So I've been reading about desecrated black cemeteries. Um, there's one in Georgia where the woman said in 18, where they've discovered that hundreds of bodies were in the cemetery and are now just people, historians and family members are beginning to reconstruct it. And so we have such a long history in this country of desecrated lands and, you know, excavating and pulling up, you know, objects, Native American graves um, in Topaz, it was the Wakasa Monument. And I think to the extent that we can understand these kinds of shared histories we have that moving forward we can build an even bigger community and don't want to make people feel that because they weren't at this particular irecho pilgrimage that they're left out so go and interact with the book and activate your own community and um and it'll go online and then you can also i think there's going to be the ability to add visual components like pictures and things like that so we're just at the beginning stage and I think this, as Kurt said, there's going to be three parts, and this is just the beginning part, so it's very exciting. I'll jump from where Nancy is, I think that's the perfect piece. I want to take your question very literally, Kimiko, of kind of what next, and I think of the Iehi. Um, so from this, you know, me and Don Cameron joking about a mini Ireto, right, like a mini version of this, and these Irehi, uh, these kind of light monuments, you know, are going to start finding their way. 2024, folks, Amachi. Jerome, Heart Mountain, Manzanar, Minidoka, Post and Roar in Tule Lake. Uh, 2025, Jana will be, uh, Japanese American National Museum will be unveiling a you know, he sculpture uh, as well. Um, and just thinking about how this is going to be continuing work. So once again, if you weren't there, and trust us, you were, right? You were in that space with us. You know, these places, these this project will continue to go once again back out, right? So sand, grain, silt, earth was brought here. And now this feeling of the project, the spirit of the project, but then go back out again. So I look forward to that, to that piece. Kurt, can you explain the, what the light sculpture um, is, is going to be? Yeah. Um, so the Irehi, right? Uh, it's going to unite kind of the similar idea of uniting of this Japanese cultural pieces of memorial monuments. Um, but what's going to make it really special is going to be a digitalized component uh, where inside, and, and this might be going a little too far, Duncan, so I'm very, very sorry, but my understanding is that there'll be some technological portions that will also allow those who are visiting some of these sites of confinement and actually get to experience the ide, he will get to see a monument that might also have program names um, uh, as well. So if you weren't able to access the book in Los Angeles, Little Tokyo, you may be able to access the same sacred experience uh, with this monument put together uh, by this project. More information to come for those who go to ideazo.com, you should be able to find more information on that as well. I think it's hard to say with certainty what the future holds. 
with any of this. I mean, the pandemic has taught us, if nothing else, that to expect the unexpected and that we really can't plan some things are out of our hands. But I think that five or 10 years ago, it, it would have been hard to imagine something like this happening. And I think for a number of reasons, uh, in part because I don't think that the JA community has been this this sort of focused in in its effort for a long time, and I, again, it speaks to the power and the relationships uh, of um, of Duncan, the power of his words, the power of his project, the the incredible vision that it took to execute something like this. But then, of course, again, these these human connections and relationships that he's formed very organically over his career as an academic and a Buddhist scholar and just being in community spaces. Um, so, you know, if anything, I think it's exciting to think about the possibilities that we can't even imagine at this moment. And, you know, what new technology brings to this conversation as we continue to progress in technology. There's so many new ways to explore these stories for younger generations. And it's gonna be necessary to think about how to make this content relevant. So I agree wholeheartedly with Nancy about looking at our allyship and these sort of parallel experiences and overlapping history, parallel stories with other communities. Um, but it's just very encouraging, I think, in this moment uh, after a few very difficult years of pandemic and before that, uh, several very difficult years of political rhetoric in, in the United States. Uh, it's it's very encouraging to kind of see this. And I, I hope that the entire JA community will really kind of take this to heart and think about, you know, how, how we all can carry these stories forward, uh, both within this Ide monument and, and beyond. Thank you so much, Nancy, Janice, Kurt, Rob, Kimiko. This was, we didn't really have a plan coming into this. We just wanted to hear your thoughts and think about memory and and the future and the way that you know memory can offer us hope for how we act and what what our future holds so just thank you so much for sharing Kimiko and I were also dming about a part two so <laughs> stay tuned we might reconvene um or at least find a time to just keep having some of these conversations um thank you so much for being here thanks folks for watching please join in for Tadaima programming the rest of this week and bring your questions and your thoughts um sign up for our generational conversations that we're so looking forward to um trying to you know keep community spaces going even virtually um and just to wrap us up i'm going to pass it back to kurt with to leave us with some more words from nobuko miyamoto Fantastic. So this last piece is the outro from the song Yellow Pearl, 1973, thinking about grains of memory of earth, as Nancy said. And time is telling only how long it takes, layer after layer as our beauty unfolds, until our captors will hold in peril a grain, a tiny grain of sand. Thank you, everybody.